Wow. Uh, thank you so much to Alara and Brent for that incredibly powerful and uh, moving performance. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your stories with us this evening in uh, the Sound Gallery sessions. We're about to jump into uh, Q&A. If you'd like to get involved, it's not too late. You can uh, type in your questions in uh, the comments section of wherever you're watching us from this evening uh, in YouTube or Facebook, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, so much to, to talk about after that incredible performance. I'll let you catch your breath as well after that, Brent, too. You're right. um, Alara, I guess I wanted to start talking about a track that you performed it towards the end of uh, the set called Seed, which um, written sort of from the perspective of, of Mother Earth. Could you tell us a bit more about what that song means to you and what, what you'd like people to take away in terms of the message? Yeah, I um, you probably saw a little bit of a pause there. I was just like so caught up in like how amazing Brent was playing Didge and how it was representing it that I actually forgot a whole verse. <laughs> um, <laughs> but in the verse, you know, it, it, I meant to say, you know, we need to, it's time to abolish um, greed, white supremacy and war. And maybe I did say, it, I don't know. I, it, it, everything right now is like quite um, fast and I, I don't really know what's happening. Um, but yeah, the message is strong that... Um, as Aboriginal Indigenous people all around the world, we, we really need to be the leaders of the climate justice movement because it's not just about carbon emissions, it's about our it's about our culture. And yeah, like Brent said before, our culture is the the oldest with the oldest law. And it's those laws, those those traditions, our song lines um, that connect directly to country that kept this place well and, and kept us, you know caring for country and healthy, as healthy people um, with healthy spirit, healthy mind and healthy body um, and healthy earth. And so, yeah, I think um, Indigenous people and, and First Nations knowledge is really key to the climate justice um, and the climate space and that, yeah, too often we're always asked last um, to be included in the conversation, especially when, you know, it's our country that's being um, torn up or, you know, we belong to her but, you know, in Western way, we could maybe say that it's our country, but in our traditional way, it's, you know, we're a part of her. And so if you're destroying a part of her, you're destroying a part of yourself. Um, and that's why we need to care for our mother. I guess this, this probably leads into my next question. A, a big part of your music, Alara, is about identity and about reconnecting uh, and about education. And you've said that education is really the key. Can you maybe describe for us why that's been such an important focus of your and drive of your life's work and, and your art? Yeah, I mean, knowledge is, whew, like knowledge is really a lot. You know, you can, you can have nothing, you know, you can have no material items, um, but if you have knowledge, you've got a lot. And especially when when we're, when we're thinking about our identity, you know, if you don't connect to who you are or your family or, or your people or the country, then what do you have to live for? Um, and so it's, it's our knowledge that gives us the, those beliefs and those connections and makes us, pri makes us proud and helps keep us walking um, in a direction for, for change, you know, positive change. And Brent, you've, I guess, talked about the importance of um, teaching wisdom imparted from your ancestors and, and performing ceremony. Can you maybe reflect on the importance of preserving and, and maintaining a connection to country from your perspective? For me personally, um, I guess my journey like is a bit different. So I'm going to Kern. I've grew, grew up most of my life here in Melbourne. Um, with strong connections to Yorta Yorta country. Um, just been up to Gunna Kern country a few times, but... I was lucky enough to get, like, my auntie worked um, um, for Mornington Shire Council, so close relationship with auntie Caroline Bunwadung, and then lucky enough to... Um, my first time doing traditional dance was actually with the Rundry Mob at Dreamtime at the G, so um, just lucky, I guess, to feel connected to the land where I am and also have those elders around me. Um, but without connection, I feel like you're nothing walking, you're an empty spirit. Um, 
So if you if you cut a tree down and its roots are weak, it won't grow again. If that um, tree, its roots are strong in the ground deep, you cut that down, it's going to grow back stronger. So that's the importance of culture, law, and connecting to earth. And, you know, science have also said that um, connecting to water and nature um, is good for the spirit. So... Excellent. We need to get to some audience uh, questions very soon as well. If you've got any, you can type them in the, the comments section wherever you're watching us from. I did want to ask, though, um, both Alara and, and Brent, you are both artists who are you know, actively, um, I guess, committed to sharing you know, how you feel through, through your music. Um, and I guess with the current sort of spotlight on the Black Lives Matter movement and the, the recent protests around the country as well. I was wondering if you could, both would mind sharing some of your um, reflections and, and feelings on the events over the last couple of weeks. Maybe I'll start with you, Lara. Yeah, I mean, this, this story of um, police brutality and, and the murder of, um, of black people isn't a new story. That's something that has been in our lives since the you know, this very start of invasion and that's something that's still happening to our mob to this day. Um, so it, it wasn't a surprise to see that. Um, what was a surprise to me was to see how quickly this specific um, murder of the brother George um, Floyd went incredibly viral and I was, you know, I shouldn't be surprised but every time... Um, I guess the mainstream Australia shows their ignorance. I'm just like horribly disappointed at how ignorant um, this country is and it's incredibly disappointing. So I guess the message that I want to say is like just because, you know, maybe you stepped up, maybe you went to the rally, maybe you um, posted a black square this, this one time, um, I just want to note, like let you know that that's – if that's the first time you've done anything, that's amazing, that's incredible, um, but don't let it be the last mm. because this, this fight is a long fight and we've dedicated our lives to it and our ancestors and our elders dedicated their lives to it. So, um, but we're only three, you know, Indigenous people here in Australia are only 3% of the population. So if we do want real change, it's going to take everybody. Mm. How about, about you, Brent? Does it feel like there's finally sort of some shift happening or a bit of change in the air? Definitely a shift and um, personally I'm just trying to take advantage of it. Um, I come from an education background. I started working at my, my gallery so that led to my performance from education. Um, but yeah, exactly what Alara said, um, you know, we've dedicated our lives to this. This is every day um, and amazing to people that, you know, for the first time showed up but they need to show up at every single protest. Every time there's a death in custody, they need to be there. Anytime there's an injustice, they need to be there. Anytime mob are marching for mining, um, you know, to protect country, they need to be there. Because mother is us. We are mother. Take that away. Like I said before, we are empty. We are nothing. Um, but, yeah, I'm just hoping that it stays, um, you know, people keep the momentum going. Um, because this has changed that's needed to be hap happened. Like, I don't want to be dancing about suicide rates, about genocide, but I'd rather, like, the so much positives about culture, which I'd rather be focusing on. But sadly, I have a child and I don't want him to grow up in this racist world, so I've got to do whatever I can so he doesn't, yeah, get to grow up in that world. But, yeah, just everyone needs to keep turning up and also educate themselves. Education is the biggest key, and I believe there is a reason why Aboriginal education isn't permanently in schools, as long as... Australia's asleep, don't know about Indigenous issues, they can wreck our land, they can do whatever they want to our people. As soon as people know about our culture, how old it is, how beautiful it is, then people will fight. So um, I believe that education um, is key to all of this. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, long conversation. It is. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> Well, thank you uh, so much to both of you for, for sharing uh, your thoughts. And uh, we should get to some audience questions on the Sound Gallery sessions as we are running out of time. Uh, we've got one coming through that says, how do you balance modern life with your culture? What do you teach your son for him not to forget? I guess that's aimed at you, Brent. Beautiful question. Um, so the thing is, like, when I'm walking through, um, like, parklands, like, pointing out birds... Wa, um, you know, the crow being the healer, um, Bunjil being the creator, um, showing him, you know, the gum leaves, getting to smell it, like recognising the river, but recognising it for its spiritual sense. Um, 
also walking, seeing rubbish, picking it up, like that's law right there, walking law. Like, you know, you pre- um, looking after country. Me personally, I have littered, like, you know, I won't lie, but it's about changing my mindset in which, you know, I've done and, um, you know, just, you know, lead by example, that's all it is. Um, but I guess it does get hard when you don't know culture um, and don't have the ac- like, uh, accessibility to it. Um, so I'm very blessed to have that. But, um, you know, there's always, yeah, just, you know, going through the park, breathing, meditating on it um, and just looking at everything. From, okay, so I say acknowledgement to country is every day. When, you, when you're walking, you're acknowledging that tree, you're acknowledging that bird. So it's an everyday thing and right there you are living with culture, you're acknowledging the nature and everything around you. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Beautiful. Have we got the next – oh, question coming through. Uh, we've got one coming through from Beth who says uh, she's watching with the nine-year-old twins uh, tonight. Uh, that's great. So many great learnings for them, uh, Beth says. Thank you. Uh, the twins are fascinated by the layering in your music. Their question is, what pieces of equipment do you need to start looping? This is from Harry and Fraser who are watching tonight. This is so exciting. Best question. <laughs> Young musicians, I love it. Um, well, you can start with any any piece of equ- equipment. I know I don't know if you guys have iPads or what, but um, if you even just have a Google of like um, looping apps, so um, you don't have to go out and spend like hundreds of dollars on equipment. You can um, yeah look up looping apps on your iPhone or or that whatever. Um, but I'm using a Boss RC three hundred, which is I guess like one of Boss's top of the range loop pedals. I've got three tracks and. Um, Really, uh, nobody taught me how to do it. I just experimented and I just used um, the tools that I had. So so my tools, you know, then my double bass, it's my... I eventually got keys, but I never had keys when I started out. Um, I love the delay, so I use a bit of delay um, and Ren Reverb. Um, but, yeah, and, and a mic, so... Even if you just, you know, there's a Boss RC1, which is just like a one um, channel, one track loop station and, and just, yeah, and you can hire them and stuff as well. So you don't have to go all out and spend heaps of money. But if, if they're interested in, in getting into looping, yeah, a mic, you can do so much with that. Awesome. Thanks, Harry and Fraser. I hope that answers your question. Uh, the next one comes from Roland, who says, Hi, Alara and Brent. Thank you so much for that performance. Uh, Brent, your final dance piece at the end was incredibly moving. And uh, Roland's wondering if you could tell us more about the story behind it. So um, the way I try to uh, um, approach my performances, um, you know, go from the love, show the culture, so then they can see what's been ripped away. So I always start with the culture and that might... I have that beat, but it might change from day to day. Depends what I'm channeling, how I feel that day. Depends on maybe what traditional dance I'll do. Um, And then from there, the gunshots, that represents, you know, the frontier wars, the fact that, you know, we didn't give up this country. We were fighting this. Um, And in some places, they actually were winning. Like, they stole the guns and they were pushing them back. But then they got Aboriginal people and said, you know, if you don't track these people, we're going to... Yeah. um, Anyway. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, from there, then going into deaths in custody... Um, so I try to approach it within a storyline. So going from the first, uh, the first war here, um, you know, from then to now, we're still being locked up. We're still being, um, killed in prisons. Then from there, just about the mental health, um, of Aboriginal people today, um, in society and what it puts onto society. Um, and, you know, just in that, um, spoken word piece, um, that was only in the eighties and they were saying about poisoning the water to eradicate, like, to what, like, um, yeah, then at the end, um, going back to Indigenous land, um, beautiful brother, Neil Morris, I'm dreaming now, big shout out to him as well. Um, you know, the fact that after all of that, we are still here, we are practising culture, we are standing strong and we're going to keep fighting and keep standing strong until... Always. Always. <laughs> until always. <laughs> until the big flood comes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've got uh, Micheline, I think that's, sorry if I've uh, mispronounced your name, uh, asks, Alara, can you tell us about your relationship with the double bass? Mm -hmm. What does this instrument mean to you? Why did you choose it? Oh, um, that's a beautiful question. I actually started um, playing electric bass when I was about 12. Um, And then when I was about 14, my 
um, bass teacher said, oh, do you want to play double bass? And I was like, sure, why not? <laughs> Little did I know how heavy it is and how much space it takes up and how expensive they are. Um, but yeah, every day um, and, and every time I play, I just fall more and more in love with it and I find more and more sounds in it. And um, yeah, I mean, I studied a Bachelor of Music at Box Hill, but I've really, I really had to kind of forget a lot of what I learnt to be able to just use it as a vessel to tell the stories because, you know, what I'm doing on the double bass and on the loop station isn't complicated. It's like, you know, two chords or four chords. Um, and so it's really about the feeling that's in the music and and it's just that the expression of music is more just an extension of of my being and of my, of my soul and of my, you know, heart. So... Um, yeah, I, I'm just really lucky to to be in the position where I can, um, yeah, play it and, you know, drive around with it and, you know, have it in my house and <laughs> get coffee with it. And <laughs> <laughs> We've got um, Daria who is asking, Brent, I'm interested to hear more about your project, Culture Evolves, why you also chose this name. Um. This is a long thing, but I'm going to try to keep it short. I, like, I can talk for days, especially about culture, like all day, every day. Um, <laughs> um, so um, with Culture Evolves, um, you know, I've always – so doing traditional and my first uh, hip-hop style was Crump, um, which big shout-out to all the Crump community, all the people crumping. Um, you know, that – outside of ceremony and traditional, Crump is the closest thing that gives me that um, – so, yeah, using, um, you know, always practising traditional and hip-hop, then my auntie sort of made me these cards that said Culture Evolves. And then I'm like, yeah, that's the name. <laughs> so that sort of stuck just from my auntie seeing my practice. Um, but, yeah, Culture Evolves, I guess, I like, as a kid, I was um, been doing visual art, um, growing up seeing my nan do art, and then from there, as a kid as well, playing yidiki, didgeridoo. Um, but now dance is my main passion. I feel, um, well, Education as well, but yeah, I'll, yeah. But dance, the fact that I can show, um, people can see the trauma, I can channel the ancestors, I can channel that and people can see it visually. Um, so that's what sort of led me to dance because um, I felt that was my most powerful medium to have a voice and for my people to have a voice. Um, but yeah, my like it all started through actually education, um, you know, lucky enough to go to my, my gallery um, Colin McKinnon Dodd, the owner, um, rest in peace. Um, so, yeah, my journey started there and then literally from there I've just luckily got to meet amazing people along the way like Sister Olara um, and do a lot of different things. Um, but, yeah, my main thing has been education and all my performance, everything is sort of around that sort of basis. Um, and, yeah, just now education is my sort of main, like, I don't know, just all, after all this Black Lives Matter stuff, I just feel that education is sort of the best space to be in right now. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of my main passion and sort of main thing I'm trying to go for, culture evolves at the moment. Did you, did you want me to add to that? Because, yeah. um, like, with the work with SEED and um, working to protect country and um, building our young people up to, to have the education around knowing um, – how to do that, like free, prior and informed consent, knowing how to, um, you know, stand up for country and and, and work with other mob around that. Um, like that's what we've always done. We've always cared for country in different ways. And, and now this in um, 2020, we're just doing it in, in, a, new, in a new modern way, you know, using um, the internet and using Facebook and, and all those mediums as a way to help um, move that forward. So we're still doing what we've always done, but we're just doing it in a new way, right? And the fact is as well, culture is a living, breathing thing. It's in the stars, it's on the earth, it's how we exist. So the fact that, you know, we are, but, you know, just like, you know, me and Alara, like I said, it's evolved, we're still doing the same thing, but we've just found different ways, different new, uh, different mediums, new mediums to still do that same thing. But yeah, just culture evolves. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a last question from Lynn, who says, what do you think is missing in education, not only for Aboriginal people, but for all Australian people? Arnie Lynn. Hey, Art. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Hey, Art. <laughs> Arnie. Who, do you want to go or do, should I go? You, 
I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Should we both? Oh, <laughs> 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 um, I'll just talk from my personal experience, I guess, growing up, like, you know, you have Italian, you can learn um, Indonesian, but where's the culture? Why can't we learn culture in schools? Um, and that's the biggest downfall. It's only one day of the year or two days of the year. Um, so the first thing is, is English, maths, every single subject, putting culture in it some way or form. Um, but Australia has a long, long way to go, a long way to go. Um, like, you know, they sh- every school should have a permanent Indigenous teacher. Why can't they have a permanent Italian teacher but not a permanent? Like, it just – it doesn't make sense. And to me, that's why I hated school. Um, in year eight, I had one of the teachers say um, – so we had to choose a project and then I st- – um, chose Stolen Generation, the teacher come up to me like, oh, what are you doing? I said, Stolen Generation. She's like, oh, my God, that's such a good thing. I was like, this is a teacher in year eight. Um, so with that as well, I'm trying to um, set up things and um, talking to some amazing people about actually setting up education things for teachers because um, I've been doing Aboriginal education for like seven, eight years or so. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, I'm always – like, the teachers are always going off and doing their own thing or not paying attention. It's like you are the one that should be paying attention most because you should be implementing this knowledge in your every day-to-day class. Um, like, you know, I got permission off uh, Mandy Nicholson, but same as, like, the word Womanjika, come with purpose. Imagine every school, every class, every day they opened up and said, uh, good morning, everybody, start with language, start with, like, Womanjika, come with purpose. And imagine that, kids at a young age, what's my purpose? How do I fit into society? Like, it would just birth another generation, um, you know, if we start doing things, but they're going to have to be radical changes, which I believe in, you know, this system. Like, the guy that invented schooling said, like, you know, it was actually too cruel to implement... Um, but yeah, that's another story. <laughs> yeah, I think as well um, something that would yeah exactly. So teaching our, our culture in schools, but it's it's a lot more complicated than just being like well like we we there's not one um, one size fits all because we're such diverse mobs all around the country. Um, but I think you know wherever that the school is, it would be incredible to see connections with the local community and for for those people to be coming in regularly and you know maybe it's. Maybe it's, um, you know, elders in residence at school so that kids can be around elders and, and learn how to, how to respect the, our old people and, um, and have that, our cultural values implemented through all of the school um, classes rather than it just being like one, you know, one class, you know, once a week, but like even, you know, going to that next step and saying how can we um, ha- have a cultural lens through all of this. But, of course, that would need um, – that would need – to, we would need to work together as First Nations and, and non-First Nations people from the start mm. to make sure that that's done, you know, in the right way with, with mm. proper cultural protocols. And, you know, the last thing we need is for um, for non-Indigenous people saying, like, this is culture, go learn it. <laughs> um, but, it, it, you know, it's a process and it's a relationship and it's, mm. it's always um, evolving and, and hopefully there's going to be more healing in the next... Um, in the future and now and in the future. And just to touch on what you said, like, you know, there's over 250 nations, there's over 900 different languages. So every program has to be tailored to wherever you are. Like, you know, there could be a skeleton, but, you know, like Alara said, you know, each school, each area connecting with that community. So they have, like, you know, only that community there can tell them the stories of that land where they are. So, um, yeah, just connecting with community, connecting with Indigenous people. Um, yeah. Thank you so much to both of you. Uh, Such an incredible performance and thank you for sharing uh, your stories and your thoughts with us here tonight. There's obviously so much to discuss as well. Thanks to everyone who who, uh, asked questions as well. They were really fantastic this evening. Uh, That is it for us tonight in uh, the Sound Gallery, the David Lee Sound Gallery here at Monash University. Uh, We are back again next Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We have... Ziggy and Miles Johnson, their internationally award-winning guitar brothers, who are going to perform passionate and diverse, a passionate and diverse repertoire crisscrossing classical guitar from Australia, Spain and Latin America. 
and jazz influenced work. So I hope you can tune in for that next week. I want to give another big shout out to to our incredible uh, behind the scenes team here at MY. We love you. <laughs> love you. <laughs> so good, aren't they? Uh, who put this these incredible socially distanced uh, live streaming shows together. Uh, and yeah, we'll catch you again next week. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you. We would like to thank you and everyone involved in this experience. For more on the Sound Gallery sessions, visit monash.edu forward slash mlive.